Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, Gina and I are happy to have you on, and Laura's going to join us in a little bit, and hopefully Tom Neighbors. But um, we're excited to have, this is actually our third study club meeting. How are you, Gina? I'm good. Thank you. Happy to be here tonight. How are you doing? Uh, good. How's the weather in Dallas area? So it was a rainy day today, but nice. Okay. Otherwise, yeah. Oh, there's Tom. Hi, Tom. Yeah. Well, it's been super cold in Florida. It was probably <laughs> as low as in the low 70s today. But anyway, right. you know. Hey, Tom. Hey, Whit. How you doing? How are you doing well? How's everybody? Good. We're just letting everybody get on. We're asking about weather. How's it up in Nashville tonight? Well, yeah, thank goodness we're getting a lot of rain. We've uh, not had a lot of rain lately, so we are getting a, appropriate rain that we need. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. good. And I see Patty Dematius is on. Hey, Patty. Hey, Patty. She's on mute. Oh, there you Hi, go. Guys. Hey. Hi, How are you doing? <laughs> Great. We are having wonderful weather in Ohio. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> yeah, it's been 40 and sunny today. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. Good. What about up in um, Illinois, Mike Milligan? How are you? See if we can get Mike to unmute. Hey, Mike. Yeah, I'm good. How's the weather in sunny well, Illinois? Can you hear me? It's yes, not we bad. Can. Not bad. It's, uh, it's in the 40s for a high, so not bad for us. <laughs> good. That's good. Well, let's go ahead. And um, what we thought we would do, just to kind of kick off the conversation, and then we want to have any conversation that you all are interested in and address anything that you would like to talk about. But we just finished a wonderful uh, uh, workshop, excuse me, this weekend in St. Petersburg uh, at the Piper Education Center. And it was an airway workshop and we had a great group there and amazing interaction and learned so much together. And um, one of the topics that we spent quite a bit of time on that is one that some of you maybe haven't really addressed or learned much about is nitric oxide. And of course, that's a huge topic. Um, in our future. And so um, I'd like to share, and hey, Laura, glad you made it. Uh, I'd like to share and just throw up a few slides and we'll begin to talk about it. And Laura and, and, and Tom and Gene will jump in, but then you jump in too. So if there's something that uh, you'd like to contribute or say, or a question that you have, please jump in. And we're just going to spend this time learning together and exploring together. And let's talk about how we can implement these things in our practices as well. So please, everybody feel free to chime in. This is your meeting. Um, so I'm gonna start right here. And I'm gonna share this. You wanna, and, you wanna listen to this? No. Hmm? What is it? Okay. I the meeting in oxygen. There we go. And so, um, a chronic de decrease in what basic element on the periodic chart can absolutely ruin your oral and your whole health? Any guesses? <laughs> Did I hear somebody say oxygen? I think so. <laughs> yeah, so oxygen. Um, yeah, it. And we're really talking about breathing disorders and breathing disordered sleep. But look at the things that you see around the mouth when these things are not functioning properly. It's interesting to just look at a skull and look at the airway on a skull and see how everything is so beautifully connected when it's working well, right? Um, and one of our favorite authors, and I hope you all have been exposed to Patrick McKeon, is a book called The Oxygen Advantage, written back in, I believe, 2017. Mike, we were together when Patrick first came over um, from Ireland to speak at the 
uh, AOSH meeting, I believe it was in Dallas, Texas. And um, I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you how I met Patrick because I was um, helping with the program that year at AOSH and we had two main auditoriums with speakers going. And so I was introducing speakers in one of the rooms and then someone else was working the other room. It might've been you, Mike. And um, so I was told the first speaker was gonna be this guy from Ireland named Patrick McKeon. And someone handed me this book, The Oxygen Advantage and say he just wrote this book and this is what he's gonna be talking about. And so I read the title that said, you know, a simple scientific proven breathing technique for a healthier, slimmer, uh, faster, and fitter you. And I thought, boy, that sounds really boring. <laughs> and so I spoke with Patrick for a couple of minutes, um, went in with him and introduced him, held up his book and told everyone that they should buy it and that it was available at the meeting. And then I slipped out the back and went into the other room and listened to the other speaker because I thought it would be more interesting. I was involved with a kind of a chat group of researchers <clears throat> around the world that are interested in airway breathing and sleep disorders that um, we would just email each other all day long. Um, and there were at that point, four or 500 of us involved in that group. And one day someone posted, this was maybe within a month of the AOSH meeting, have you read this book, The Oxygen Advantage? It's the greatest thing I've read to understand breathing and what's going on with our patients and all the issues we have and the challenges and the strategies that we can develop. You've got to read it. Fortunately, I purchased the book, even though I wasn't maybe planning to read it anytime soon. And I immediately out of real surprise went, oh my gosh, I just met that guy and didn't pay any attention. So I read the book and it was fabulous. And it's really been a great influence on all of us who are working in the area of, of um, airway breathing and sleep disorders, which should be all of us. And so I wanna really highly recommend the book to you if you haven't read it. And actually, I think there's an updated version that came out in the last year or two, but uh, this one's really, really good. And so um, in the book, he introduces something that now you've all heard about. Um, I had not heard about it until I read his book, and that was the subject of mouth taping. And so um, the story behind Patrick is that there was a, a Russian scientist, a physician, physiologist named Dr. Buteyko, and he had worked with the cosmonauts during the space race in the 1960s. And he would study their physiology and their oxygen levels under different conditions and in, you know, uh, conditions where the oxygen levels were very low, uh, such as in space. And so he did an experiment with his cosmonauts where he taped their mouths shut, forcing them to breathe through their noses only. And he found their physiologic um, you know, performance improved. In fact, it improved dramatically. And he began to study the difference between nasal breathing and mouth breathing, which I don't think anybody had ever looked at. All of us thinking, what difference does it make, you know, as long as you get the air in one way or the other. And so he began to define the importance of breathing through the nose as being physiologic and breathing through the mouth as being dysfunctional breathing and actually undesirable breathing, except for, you know, very limited amounts of um, with that, um, he developed a whole thesis and philosophy of, of strategy of breathing. Well, Patrick McKeon evidently went to Russia and met with the elderly Dr. Buteyko and learned all of his ideas and methods and brought them back to Southern Ireland, where he lived, and began using it with patients that he saw, including children that had um, problems with with breathing and and um, uh, athletes, all, all sorts of different people. And one of the things that he began advocating, as did Dr. Buteyko, was nasal breathing and even mouth taping at night 
to ensure that nasal breathing was taking place. And so um, he makes the statement, we're designed to breathe through our nose and eat through our mouths. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the same things that they talk about at Stanford University in their sleep center there, headed up originally by Dr. Um, uh, uh, Christian Gimeno, where he defines something called upper airway resistance or upper airway resistance syndrome, which you may now have heard of, uh, UARS, which is really sort of like pre-sleep apnea. So if you think of airway breathing and sleep disorders like an iceberg, then what we tend to talk about is just the very tip of the iceberg, uh, which is sleep apnea. But beneath that, there's a whole lot of dysfunctional breathing going on. And the core dysfunction is what is called upper airway resistance or difficulty breathing through the nose. And if it's serious enough, it will actually cause us to convert to breathing through the mouth. And so um, that, that shift is, is an important physiologic dysfunctional shift uh, that can take place. And so you find that um, those that breathe nasally ha at night have a much less lower propensity to obstructive sleep apnea and to upper airway resistance or upper airway resistance syndrome. Um, so that's one point that he makes. And so um, he talks about how there are advantages to nasal breathing. And that's what we want to explore a little bit tonight, particularly surrounding one aspect of that. And that aspect is nitric oxide. And so um, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll show you, though, what um, Patrick has in his book here as far as how he describes mouth taping and why he advocates that. And actually in his book, I think it's on like page 67 or something like that. I've used it so many times in, in sharing this with patients. Uh, when we talk to our patients about the possibility of mouth breathing, excuse me, mouth taping to help them breathe through their nose to encourage all the good physiology that we're going to talk about including the release of nitric oxide into the respiratory system, um, then uh, the explanation that we share with them is right out of Patrick's book. And so you see here um, what it says as I highlight it. Over the years, Patrick says, I've introduced this taping method to um, lots of people with incredible results. Unless you breathe calmly through your nose at night, you have no idea what it feels like to have a great night's sleep. Taping the mouth at night is a simple but very effective technique, and while it may sound a little strange, it's well worth getting used to. Continue to wear the tape until you've managed to change breathing through your nose, change to breathing through your nose at night. How long this takes will vary from person to person, but in general, Patrick feels that wearing the tape for around three months is long enough to restore the habit of nasal breathing during sleep. And then he goes on to say, breathing through your nose will result in a naturally moist mouth when you wake up. If your mouth is dry when you wake up, you know your mouth was open during sleep. I wonder how many of our patients who report dry mouth, this is what's going on, and we tend to explain it as a result of medications, which it can be, but I wonder how often it is more often related to mouth breathing at night. At the end of the paragraph, he says, wearing tape across the lips during sleep or when alone in your house during the day gradually trains the body to adapt to nasal breathing both day and night. Spending a guaranteed eight hours breathing through your nose while you sleep is an opportune way to re-educate your respiratory center to adjust to a more normal breathing volume. And so, um, that's his comment about that. And so I want to explore a little bit together. Um, what's the story of nasal breathing and mouth taping? And so um, as we look at this a little bit more closely, I want to bring up the subject of nitric oxide. And Gina and Laura, please jump in uh, on anything that you would like to say about this as we go through. But did you know that in 1998, three pharmacologists 
that you see here and you see their names listed, won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for the subject of nitric oxide as a signaling molecule in the cardiovascular system. Gina, how long have you been looking at that as somebody who's a who's a, has a specialty in cardiovascular risk? Is this fairly new or has it been talked about for several years? So the first time that I really um, was aware of this, became aware of this and started uh, implementing testing and, and supplementation for nitric oxide, looking at this concept was probably in 2010, maybe 2012, oh. very recent for me, really 10 years yeah. ago, maybe. But we in the we were given a book by one of our colleagues from Texas Heart, uh, Nathan Bryan, as you know. The, so I, can't I, was, find them. I was working in the cardiology pr practice at the time. We were given his book, and as I mentioned to you before, it seemed like kind of propaganda because it talked about oh, nitric oxide, the miracle molecule, fixes everything. But once you dug into the science, you saw that indeed, low nitric oxide, without a doubt correlates with the development of atherosclerosis. And then when we started to treat nitric ox low nitric oxide deficiency in the cardiology office, we definitely saw lowering of blood pressure and improvement in atherosclerosis. So it's very, yeah. very important. In, in a little bit, I want Laura to explain about the blood pressure connection with what goes on in the mouth. It's, it's incredibly important. And it's something that I would say almost nobody knows. And so um, as you read here, nitric oxide is an important mediator and inflammatory marker in the upper airway. Um, there are enzymes responsible for producing nitric oxide shown both in the nose and in the paranasal sinuses, but the nitric oxide levels in the sinuses next to the nose are several times higher uh, than those in the nose than those in the nose itself. And so um, here's a statement. It says, healthy paranasal sinus epithelium expresses a nitric oxide synthase and continuously generates large amounts of nitric oxide, a gas with potent. And here are the two of the important things they found in their research that nitric oxide will vasodilate, uh, the respiratory system, starting with the nose all the way down into the lungs, and also the circulatory system. And so we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And then it also is a gas that has a very potent antimicrobial activity. It kills bacterial microbes on contact. So imagine in your nose, when you're breathing through your nose, that it's both dilating the nose all the way down through your lungs and also killing bacteria that try to enter uh, through the nose or through into your body through the air. And so the importance is tremendous. That's just one part of this truly miracle molecule that has a critical role in the body throughout our lifetime. And so let's dig in a little bit farther. Um, Gina, you want to talk about this one? Yeah, so talking about this nitric oxide synthase, uh, for one, we know we can get improvement in nitric oxide by changing our diet. So it's a wonderful opportunity to talk to our patients in the dental office or the non-dental office about lifestyle changes that can have a tremendous effect on their uh, reduction in atherosclerosis and reduction of heart attack and stroke risk. And one other thing I want to say while we have this nitric oxide synthase slide up is this enzyme critically important to take the, um, the mediators down the right pathway to end up in usable nitric oxide. And I say all of our, uh, the lining of all of our blood vessels need to be bathed in nitric oxide. But I wanna tie it to our infection and inflammation uh, work that we talk about, because whenever we're sharing information between the dental and non-dental office about inflammatory markers, and we talk about that one that's not commonly talked about, ADMA, if ADMA is elevated, then we know without a doubt that there is impaired nitric oxide synthase. So this person is 
definitely low in nitric oxide. And if you test them there at the chair side, you'll see that that's the case. And it's an opportunity to educate them not only on improving their diet, but the importance of getting that home sleep test and looking into a possibility of uh, airway disorder. Mm, very interesting. And, um, you know, we've all heard if you want to have a healthier heart, that you eat a lot of kale and things like kale. And so here's why. Um, you see that uh, kale and other leafy green vegetables and other things that are now well known like beets, et cetera, are very rich in nitrogen uh, that can be converted into nitric oxide. Um, Dr. Esselstein at the Cleveland Clinic who of course is very well noted now for writing the book, uh, Preventing and Reversing Heart Disease, is all about this slide. Um, the, almost entirely the whole treatment uh, that he engages with, with his patients with uh, atherosclerosis that can be at a very severe level is through the use of nutrition and the ramping up of nitric oxide. Um, being able to dilate literally uh, the vessels in order to reverse the obstruction. So Gina, comment on that a little bit more if you would. Yeah, so really this gives us the science to back up what our mothers and grandmothers told us all along. Eat your vegetables, right? Yeah. Uh, and we also know that nitric oxide just naturally decreases with each decade of life. So we thought atherosclerosis and other chronic diseases were just a disease of aging. It's inevitable that it's going to happen. But this is just one simple, daily, easily implementable uh, change in our life that we can reverse that process and um, reverse aging and delay the onset of chronic diseases, just eating more vegetables, particularly the dark colored ones. Yeah. So we're building a list, aren't we? We're understanding that nitric oxide is super important, both in our respiratory health, as well as our vascular health. And so we've identified one source of nitric oxide is coming through the nose and the nasal sinuses and the synthase there that's con making that conversion. So nasal breathing, top of the list. But also here we see nutrition and foods that are rich in nitrogen um, in various forms are also extremely, extremely important part of the equation. So we'll build on that because we're actually gonna identify a few different things that can make a big difference. So here's an interesting, um, slide. Do you want to comment on this one, Gina or Laura? Well, really, it's just Laura probably wants to comment on this as well. But I just wanted to say that it's what I was saying earlier, that we know the endothelial production of nitric oxide decreases with age. And so, of course, atherosclerosis is going to develop and progress with age if we don't intentionally uh, implement these things we're talking about today, nasal breathing eating vegetables, we'll talk about more. We don't aren't intentional about those things, then we're of course gonna lose nitric oxide and have high blood pressure, have vascular disease and other chronic diseases. So this, this particular um, gas may be a super important key to longevity and health and uh, anti-aging and uh, preventing and reversing atherosclerosis and the risks that go with that. Um, but yet we know from this slide that in our culture, at least, um, that we're constantly <laughs> declining year by year by year, unless we're proactive. And, you know, isn't that really what this whole group is really about is how can we take control in essence of, of trying to create our own good health and that for our families and our patients. And so obviously this is a very personal discussion tonight. I hope that each one of you will be thinking, okay, what can I do uh, to keep that curve squared off and not just declining year by year by year? And you see how dramatically it drops after about age 40. It starts really taking a big dive in, in many people. And isn't that the time when you see such an increase in hypertension and the beginning of seeing uh, arterial disease that manifests itself in so many different ways? So that can be key. You can measure your nitric oxide. Uh, Laura, you want to comment on this? 
Sure. I just want to say on that back slide, I hope everyone took away why screening early is so important. Look at the first age. I'm just going to pick on the men of the group here. Look at that and think about our gingivitis, our periodontal disease. You know, that's in their 20s. Look at our women starting. Now we're approaching to 30. These are our patients every day in our chair. I really want you to see why screening for this is such a important piece of the puzzle because for me, being so grounded in the dysbiosis that's occurring, people are always asking, well, when did this happen? How did this happen? And I just want you to plug this piece into the puzzle. Look how early in life this statistic is starting to happen and why that's an important piece of our puzzle. So yes, let's start testing nitric oxide right at the chair. It takes as what showed on the next screen, literally laying the test strip on the tongue for five seconds. That's all it takes to get the saliva on the test strip. You then fold it in half, you hold that for 10 seconds, and there you get the results. Now, as a hygienist of 28 years, I've done it the hard way to try to get somebody to do a sleep test, right? The scallop tongue, the high palate, the tori, <laughs> I can't see your uvula, right? Uh, are you sure you don't snore? Let me talk to your wife, you know? <laughs> I'd say we could go down the hard way or in 10 seconds, I can instantly <clears throat> get my patient's attention and bring that how it relates to what Dr. Pritchard's talking about, telling them every time I take your blood pressure, this is the nitric oxide working. It allows the vessel to expand and contract. So obviously those cardiovascular patients, now I'm getting their attention. And I do always make the joke. I like to pick on my men like, hey, let me give you a little supplement to try. Within 90 minutes, you can test again, see if your nitric oxide levels come up and it can help you <laughs> work out this afternoon and it can help you on your date tonight. Um, <laughs> and I let them just think about that for a minute. Like, okay, yeah, let's get that sleep test. So I feel like it's important to understand as you're putting the story together, wow, look at what's happening in 20s. Wow, how many people I can just in my full assessment do a simple 10 second test, get them started in airway to get a sleep test, but actually start what I say, like treatment today at the chair, talk about supplementation. Mm -hmm. I wonder what percentage of people that snore have very depleted uh, nitric oxide levels. I would bet most all, um, just because the majority of people that snore are mouth breathers. And so just, you can start putting together all the different scenarios of what the implications are for this. Um, what percentage of people with anterior open bites and tongue thrusts have low nitric oxide levels because you know they're mouth breathers? Those with crowded arches and and um, V-shaped palates, what percentage of them have very depleted nitric oxide levels? And we could have a long discussion uh, about that. Um, so uh, interesting, all you do is you just take the little litmus paper and you put it on your tongue for about 10 seconds and you fold it in half so it's touching the activator. And within less than a minute, you can read uh, the color off of your um, litmus test. And you can see here as an example of someone who went through kind of an experimental phase with a uh, N of one, uh, they weren't mouth taping um, and found that their nitric oxide levels were depleted just mouth tape for a period of time and then repeated uh, the test strip and their nitric oxide levels had gone up and then added a nitric oxide supplement and it went up to a high level. So you see, they had a strategy that they could actually test the effectiveness of this. And so let's talk now again about the reasons why nitric oxide can be high or how we can raise it. Um, one would be a, nit a nitrogen-rich nutrition. So there's your kale, cruciferous vegetables, beets, et cetera. We said mouth taping at night can definitely increase your nitric oxide levels. Um, we saw on this test on the left, they had used a supplement. Here's an example of a supplement of nitric oxide by a company in California called Berkeley Health Professional. Um, but then there's a fourth one. And this is the one that really 
uh, can hit home to us on a daily basis in, in dentistry, and that is a healthy oral microbiome. But we need to describe more exactly what that means. And so let's talk about that. Um, so when we look at this, and Laura, I'm going to ask you to talk about this because this is right in your wheelhouse. Well, yeah, I, you know, I guess what I want people is again, now we're moving to that next level. We talked about creating nitric oxide through nasal breathing, right? And how that's even anti like microbial. Now we're saying that's not happening. Now, what is happening in the oral microbiome? That's a direct connection here because we do make nitric oxide two ways. Our first way, that nasal breathing, nice nasal breathing. The second way is we actually have to have healthy common cell bacteria, a healthy oral microbiome that actually produces these nitrate reducers and that converts into nitrite, which you're seeing here if you're reading into nitric oxide. And so this conversion is really important. And as we then test for the nitric oxide, you can see why saliva testing then becomes important because if we don't have these healthy oral micro communities, then we're not able to make that nitric oxide. And so what you're looking at here on the left is the growth of these bacterial species, right? What is growing on the tongue? It's really important to know that because this is that pathway, how that is happening. We have to have these healthy bacteria and there's lots of things that wipe them out. But I think what's so important is then as we're connecting this to what Dr. Pritchard is talking about, now we're connecting to the vascular system. So of course we're seeing it in blood pressure, right? And then we're going to talk about how we're seeing it in the GI tract. But I really want everyone to just take a minute and really read how the oral microbiome communities are so important that to make the nitric oxide production, and it's really taking the nitrate reducers, they're able to do this and actually convert it to the first step, which is nitrite. So I kind of go back to school here. We were, we all kind of know if we go back like, oh yeah, the first level of digestion happens where? In the mouth. Somebody asked the question, well, can I eat cooked vegetables and get as many nitrates? Unfortunately, no. A lot of our cooking and that damages these types of enzymes. And in this case, our nitrate reducers. And so eating more raw vegetables and getting it that way, even, you know, there's a lot of controversy. What about meats and things that have nitrate and nitrites? Well, Dr. Nathan Bryan's book has debunked that myth. That's actually a myth. Some poor studies were done because they didn't look at all the root causes or variables or factors, as you would say. So again, we have to know what we're looking for in our diet. The best way is always, I'd say, for vegetables, right? Raw vegetables, getting those as close to nature as possible. But this is why then saliva testing is so important because if we're not having the healthy nitrate reducers, right, we don't have other species as well. And what will take up this space? Well, then we'll start growing the anaerobic pathogens. So now we're shifting from aerobic healthy common cell bacteria to anaerobic. And that's when our top five high-risk pathogens will start to grow and show up. Mm -hmm. So there's a really important um, community and it's organized as you can see on the tongue. It's quite spectacular to see this. Um, and they're functioning in a very specific way to help us digest and produce nitric oxide to go throughout our bodies. And so that's where the nutrition uh, and saliva and, um, and bacteria come together. Uh, but here's something that's really important. It says at the end of this article, previous studies demonstrated that disruption of this circulation of nitrate can happen by the use of oral antiseptics that can result in increases in systolic blood pressure. Gina, would you comment on that? 
Yeah, so 25% of this nitric oxide is recirculated through salivary recirculation, if you will. So this is absolutely what we started to see in the cardiology office when we were first learning about this. And now fast forward to today, it's just everybody we see every day, Laura, right? We're like, oh, they need nitric oxide. Oh, they got to eat more green vegetables. And it's one of the reasons that you know, hypertension is so rampant in this um, world, for sure in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, to have healthy oral bacteria is critical on many levels. And here is a really critical one. So here's Nathan Bryan. And by the way, I'm going to stop right here and tell you that you must put on your calendar tonight. April 20th and 21st, 2023, to come to St. Petersburg, because we're going to have our first ever um, IDM Scholar Society Revolution, which is a symposium. And what we're going to do is going to be so much fun. We're going to have 20 different uh, presentations that will be 25 minutes each, basically TED Talks or Med Talks for two solid days. And Dr. Nathan Bryan, who Gina has worked with and is really probably the, the top researcher in this important subject of nitric oxide, is going to come to be with us as our guest and is going to be uh, giving two of the presentations during, uh, during that symposium. So I'm so excited to have him agree to come and be with us. And we have a number of really amazing uh, researchers and clinicians doing landmark work like his uh, that are going to come be with us. So, um, uh, Gina, do you want to explain more about what he describes <laughs> about mouthwash? Yeah. So um, he was talking in your slide here about how the dental hygiene practices um, some of the mouthwashes that are described. And actually, Lori, you're much better uh, versed at speaking about this in me, than me. But we, again, see it in our practice every day, don't we? When people thinking that they're doing a good thing, and sometimes even on the recommendation of their dentist or dental hygienist, continue to use a certain uh, harsh chemical, whether it's mouthwash or, or other types of um, I, solutions to use in the mouth. I'll just say it like that. And continued use of these harsh chemicals. Some of them are, you know, most of them are just readily available at every pharmacy in the United States. You can just go in and pick the one that you like the flavor of, and you're going to do damage by using that on a daily basis. And certainly it's, again, no wonder people have atherosclerosis and high blood pressure and chronic diseases. I, or, I, I, oh, go I, ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I just want to tie in those that are salivary testing. This is when we talk about, hey, did we have the first shift in dysbiosis? We see the TF show up. And then we also are asking, do we have resistant strains? This is when we see that abnormal growth going on where maybe there's a skip in one of the pathogens and that's not a normal growth or something is higher than FN, something is higher on the left-hand side. And this really is what Dr. Nathan Bryant's talking about. When I met him, I hope you can all know how excited I was because this is one of the first people I feel like, oh my God, I told Dr. Gina, it's like I wrote the book. It's like he is pointing to all of our dental hygienists out there saying, hey, is what you're doing helpful? or harmful. And Dr. Pritchard always asks that, right, with our patients, is it helpful or harmful? And we need to be testing and knowing what we're about to tell our patient to be using as an agent or a product. Is it actually helpful for this patient or could it actually be, as he's talking about, very harmful, killing off these bacteria that not only wipe out our nitric oxide, but then we see the systemic effect as uh, Dr. Witt so beautifully explained with our blood pressure here. So again, we're connecting the dots for you. So how you can see each one of these tests, what you're looking for in your treatment plan and in the story, in the journey with the patient. 
Yeah, and with, I also just want to say that I hope Nathan Bryan will speak about it at the symposium. I'm sure he will. But his team of researchers years ago, when they were trying to figure this out, have dramatic research findings. Maybe you have some of it in the upcoming slides. I'm not sure. But they measured the brachial artery in the arm before and after various interventions, things that would they theorized would reduce nitric oxide and then things that they theorized would improve nitric oxide and directly translate to dilatation of the brachial artery, meaning if increased nitric oxide would dilate every artery in the body. And the results are dramatic. And the results are dramatic in these, each segment of life as well. So I'm hoping he'll present that data because um, seeing the, the dramatic, I mean, it, it is like, Nitric oxide, I tell everyone, it's very similar to nitroglycerin. Probably everyone has heard of nitroglycerin, the little tablets that we prescribe for patients with angina, with chest pain, with heart disease. They put a nitroglycerin under the tongue if they have chest pain and they're out and about, and they think, oh, this might be my heart. The reason being nitroglycerin has a dramatic dilatation of all the arteries in our body, but particularly our heart arteries so that blood flow is maximized. And so nitric oxide is similar in that it's our own endogenous naturally produced nitroglycerin. It's that powerful. And Nathan's work um, showing the dilatation of the brachial arteries demonstrates that. Mm. And um, I think I'm correct in reading some of his work that uh, even what they were looking at with chlorhexidine was increasing blood pressure. Is that right, Laura? Yes, yeah, so we have lots of studies and really don't, you know, I say you can look at somebody asks even on here, yeah, chlorhexidine, your fluorides, your chlorides, your chlorates, your, you know, anything that has this type of chemical agent, your hydrogen peroxides, you can even, you know, they're doing a blistering with their scopes. So anything that is a constant creates what we say a stress in the body, an oxidative stress. And when we're doing that for a repeated period of time, we're seeing this change in the oral microbiome bacteria. And that is causing that shift then they're seeing in the nitric oxide. When you're wiping out a lot of the healthy species, then you're now promulgating, promoting what I'm going to say unhealthy to grow. They're going to take advantage. Remember they're opportunistic. So there's lots of agents. We have a lot of studies on chlorhexidines. I know a lot of People are very familiar with those studies, but it isn't just one agent. I want you just to think of them as like chemical agents, what it could be of various products that would be classified in those categories. Okay, very interesting. Um, and what percentage, how many people in the United States use a mouthwash regularly? I think it was estimated to be about 200 million. Yeah. So um, if this is as significant as the research is showing, then it would make sense that we may have 200 million people with high blood pressure. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, was look, I was looking online while we were talking, and Nathan Bryan has just published an article in August of this year. For those that don't have his book, it's called The Oral Microbiome, Microbiome Nitric Oxide and Exercise Performance but he deals with all of those stats that you are talking about and Laura's talking about, and also all of the rinses that Laura was talking about. So, so for those that want to download that tonight, it's just simply called the Oral Microbiome Nitric Oxide and Exercise Performance by Nathan mm -hmm. Bryant. Great, thanks, Tom. Yeah. That's good. Let's just stop for a second. And, and um, if you all like to chime in a little bit, there's a little bit more we want to talk about, but you know, there's a lot to talk about already. So what thoughts, um, concerns, panic <laughs> are you having right now as we're talking? And I guess we can unmute people or you, can you unmute yourself? I'm not sure how that works. I'm looking you can either post in the chat or raise your hand and uh, Kim will unmute you or just unmute yourself and ask a question or in interject. Hmm. Quiet group. Yeah, I'm just looking through some of the chat comments.
Can you hear me? So here's my question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, I, I actually had two questions. Hey, One Paul. Is, hi there. Um, hey, Paul. Hi. Um, one is if palatal expansion is palatal expansion needed if nitrogen nitric oxide is um, if, if we have an abundance of nitric oxide is palatal expanded needed is that what you said yes and and ah. then my other question was you know you see a lot of people that um, at the bottom of their feet they have the the dark iron on their legs. Mm -hmm. Is that, and I know they talk about that being a, an iron problem, but is that due to this nitric oxide not being in your system? Hmm. I just thought I'd throw those out there. Yeah. Thank you all. G Thanks, Paul. Gina, would you comment on that? I guess I don't. I don't know about a direct correlation. I would think it would play a role, but I really can't speak expertly about that. But I, in just thinking through it physiologically, it seems like it could be connected if you're talking about the dark on the, the bottom of the feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want in terms yeah. of iron production, that's for sure. Um, Kim Meyer, you had a comment that you had for everyone. And um, if you would like to speak to that, it would be great about uh, training with Patrick and and um, those that have difficulty breathing through the nose so that mouth taping wouldn't be a good idea. Can you comment on that? So yes, I actually have four hygienists that I have trained as Buteco breathing coaches uh -huh. with Patrick McCune. And um, I know from a lot of patients that are, as we know, a lot of our patients are suffering from anxiety right now. And if you fully tape the mouth, they can panic. And actually Patrick has a breathing technique for anxiety, but for some people it doesn't work. So we actually use a nasal spray called Clear, X-L-E-A-R, uh -huh. which actually we have them use six times a day to help clear the inflammation in the nose. Uh -huh. And we have them either use what are called mutes or uh -huh. use um, nasal cones, as right. well as pot potentially the nasal strips. And then, then they start with a corner of the lip taping and then they can actually Patrick sells myotape, it's called, starts by going around the lips. Uh -huh. So he has so much information, but um, we use CBCTs a lot. I use them for all my patients. And in the nose, you can see skeletal and soft tissue inflammation and dairy and environment can also be causing a huge amount of inflammation in the nose. Mm -hmm. So we usually start with at least uh, 30 days of um, nasal sprays before we, you know, some people can tape and it, and it works very well, but some people will get built up anxiety from taping the mouth and mm -hmm. you don't tape straight across. You'll start with just a corner, but we can actually see a lot of the inflammation just on our images that we take. Mm -hmm. And also if you have them close their mouth, and if they cannot close their mouth and breathe through their nose for a minute or more, they're not going to be a good taping candidate. Mm -hmm. They have to work on the nose first. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing You're that welcome. experience that you've had. That's so invaluable. Great Thank stuff. You. Yeah. Um, Vic had a comment or question. Um, Vic, do you want to speak up about your comment about rather than taping, are there any appliances? Yeah, my, my concern was, uh, and Kim shared some of that as far as uh, some people might not be able to tolerate mouth tapings or their appliances that might achieve similar effects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, <laughs> with appliances, obviously, you can open the vertical in the oral cavity and you can move the horizontal 
uh, in Petrusa of, of the mandible and try to open the airway that way. We're still trying to convert people to nasal breathing, though, just using an oral appliance that moves the jaw forward and opens the posterior pharynx doesn't solve the mouth breathing issue. Um, increase it too, right? Some people might actually start. It might, yeah. Space. So one of the things that we're aware of is that many people mouth breathe as a habit of breathing that they've developed from the past. So let's say you had a child with allergies and they converted because of upper airway resistance to becoming a mouth breather. If they outgrew those allergies, they're probably still going to mouth breathe just because that's their habit. And um, so uh, I know part of GMNO and the group at Stanford found that when they would have children that had swollen tonsils and adenoids that were removed, that those children that then were trained through oral myofunctional therapy to become nasal breathers um, did great. Those that had no conversion, we'll call it, from mouth breathing, which almost all of them were, to nasal breathing, they had a lot more problems in the future, even though they'd had their tonsils and adenoids removed. And some, the tonsils and adenoids may even start to grow back because there's remnant tissue there. And, and they did find that the percentage of those children that were mouth breathers became much higher for the risk of developing sleep apnea later in life than those that were nasal breathers. And so there's a lot of components to this. Um, and I love the way that Kim's describing it because she's still working toward the goal of nasal breathing, but just sneaking up on it if it's not something you can just jump right into. And certainly that that may be the case. I would say, and, and Kim, you may have a population of patients that are coming to you because of the severity of their issues. Just like in my practice, historically, I've seen so many patients that are off the disc in the jaw joints, you know, and in an inordinate number of people that are that severe that you might see once a year in your, you know, general practice. But um, one of the things that um, uh, we find even as we're teaching classes is if we have a class with 100 people and we say, how many of you in the audience have nasal congestion right now, a significant nasal congestion right now, or maybe chronic nasal congestion? I would say about 10 out of 100 uh, will raise their hand. Um, and so let's just call it for discussion sake, 10%. Um, I will say to them, if you will and can, close your mouth for the next 10 minutes and try to breathe through your nose if you can, and I'll get back to you. And 10 minutes later, we'll stop and say, okay, where were the 10 people that had nasal congestion? Um, and you now tried to breathe through your nose exclusively the last 10 minutes. How many of you feel like your congestion has improved? About nine out of 10 will raise their hand and some will say, it's completely cleared my congestion. Is that because they're now actually activating the release of nitric oxide and, and using actually functioning in their nose and all the other processes that go on. Hey, somebody is, is unmuted and we're listening to your family. So if you could put yourself on mute, we'd appreciate it. Um, anyway, um, um, we hear a child speaking and I don't think it's one of you all. Um, anyway, um, <clears throat> so in that case, um, you know, it seems to indicate that many people can convert to nasal breathing quickly and effectively and even with a great response, um, but there will be a percentage that can't. And, and certainly that's, you know, the, probably a lot of the population that Kim is dealing with in her more specialized practice, but great advice, you know, that we've got to, to do that. Now, Vic, also, um, there are for example, um, Keith Thornton, who's in Dallas, Texas, and is one of the pioneers in oral appliance therapy for sleep. Uh, he developed the TAP appliance, which stands for Thornton Anterior Positioner. Um, he has a trial appliance that he calls the MyTAP, M-Y-T-A-P, that is a boil and bite upper and lower, uh, basically like trays that are connected in the front with a stem, and they 
connect together and it has a little dial in the front that you could move the mandible in and out. More recently, I would say in the last year, um, Keith has added a little rubberized shield that goes over the whole appliance and tucks inside of the lips with the effort to seal the mouth closed. Now, that would be a substitute for mouth taping. Um, it doesn't assure that you don't breathe through your mouth as well as tape would, but um, that's an effort to use something different. And there are different ways of trying to keep the mouth shut if someone has an anxiety uh, feeling with tape. Um, there is something called chin-up tape that actually goes around the mouth shaped like a U on one side of the mouth and on the other side of the mouth, but it goes under. And when you pull that together, it'll actually keep the mouth closed. You can also use those chin straps that are used for snoring that you can get in CVS or Walgreens, I believe. And those are really good uh, for keeping the mouth closed for someone who, for example, has a beard and, um, you know, doesn't want to tape or do something similar. So um, those are things. But um, Kim's advice on nasal dilating um, is really good. And we have found that people will say, wow, I can really breathe a lot better through my nose just putting this dilator, um, you know, or breathe right strip that it encourages nasal breathing just because they can really tell that things are more opened up. And um, now they actually, at the last AOSH meeting, were displaying um, nasal stents that can be put in at night that are just like the stents you put in your arteries. Um, they actually have them that'll go into your nose or can go all the way uh, to the pharynx. Um, it, it looked like it would take a little practice to learn how to do that, but they're little metal type stints that you put in, uh, in, in the nose at night. So that's an interesting idea. Uh, I haven't had any experience with it. I don't know if any of you all have, but, um, so there are new things that are being discussed that may, may have some, some, um, potential. Um, let's see. Just a quick follow-up question, though, yes. uh, Doc, is that with the chin straps, again, aren't you causing problems with the tongue, you know, things that you're trying to reverse with uh, mandibular advancement with that? Uh, and I'm, I'm certainly willing to try it with the patients. And such, but, uh, um, a problem with the tongue with using a chin strap, basically, it's just holding by retreating, the mandible. By retreating the mandible. Oh, by retreating the mandible. Um, well, you don't... Theoretically. Yes, there are patients that we're just trying to get them nasal breathing and we're not really trying to protrude the mandible. They don't always have um, an airway problem in the posterior pharynx. So if gotcha. we're trying to convert them to nasal breathing for the purpose of releasing nitric oxide and dilating the system, um, then uh, if we're not also simultaneously trying to protrude them, um, then, then a chin strap is an option. Yeah. So I understand your point and that would be true. Perfect. Perfect. Somebody posted that as a comment. So it was, it was interesting that their score actually improved with an appliance and uh, mouth taping. So I was curious. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, of course, uh, you can last... use... yeah, that was me. Uh, hey, Whit, Allison. Uh, hey, Allison. Yeah, Allison. Tell us what you're doing. Uh, well, I just... Um... You know, I, I, I try things on myself before I recommend it to my patients. Yeah, everything and, but surgery. And mm -hmm. so I was really surprised to learn that I had mild apnea. You know me. I'm petite. Uh -huh. um, and my, my original apnea score is like 7.2, something like that. And so I made myself a dorsal appliance and I retested after about a month of wearing it. And uh, I was at about a 5.7, you know, a little bit of improvement. But then this past weekend um, at, at our, our uh, meeting, I tested again using the dorsal and mouth taping and it was down to 2.1 hmm. so you know i just have to be convinced that there's something to that yeah and i tell you what i slept really really well yeah 
Well, if it's dilating, of course, the, the idea, and for you all that aren't familiar, a dorsal appliance is basically a style of sleep apnea appliance that moves the mandible forward and holds it there all night so that you can't drop back or, um, you know, retrude the mandible. Um, so the idea is to pull the mandible and the base of the tongue forward, trying to open up the posterior airway. Um, but uh, with that, um, with nasal breathing and the dilation that comes uh, with that, it may also encourage the tongue to reposition more properly in the roof of the mouth. And so um, that combination uh, may help even with the appliance in your mouth, your tongue control may be very much improved if you're mouth taping and breathing through your nose exclusively, um, we would certainly assume. Other comments and thoughts, this is great. Let's see. Michael Steinberg wants to know, uh, Gina, whether we uh, uh, take these vegetables and eat them raw. I think we talked about that a little bit, that um, that can be very positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I mean, so, better to eat vegetables than not, but more benefit. Yeah. Some of probably, both. Probably, good. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then let's see, Dr. Schlosser says, of course, this can also correlate with the loss of teeth ability to choose these foods and the cardiovascular disease rate for the edentulous. Um, Vic asked if nitric oxide supplementation was helpful and effective, and it definitely, definitely is. Um, we showed you the Berkeley Life uh, professional um, supplements. I believe Nathan Bryan, and help me, Gina, Laura, but I believe he is now associated with a company uh, that is making a nitric oxide supplement. True? That's the Neo... Yeah, N-O-2-U, N-O, the number two, and the letter U. And it's actually N-O, the number two, letter U, dot com. So you can go there and find both a powder that you can put in your drink and water and a, lo a lozenge. And the lozenge actually is a higher dose than the Neo 40 original lozenge that some of you may be familiar with. Um, so it's uh, ex those are excellent products. Yeah. Kim, you want to comment um, to everyone about your uh, statement about Alzheimer's and the research there and um, its relationship to breathing, poor diet and exercise? Sure. Um, because I work as a TMJ Sleep Therapy Center and I also am, have own, my own personal concerns about Alzheimer's, I did a a whole um, move for the mind session with a bunch of the top doctors out there. And they were stating that there were studies that were done, I think in California with Alzheimer's patients where they, if they improved their sleep, they got proper exercise and healthy nutrition. They were able to reverse mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, I think up to stage five. Um, mm -hmm. And also they played music from when that um, patient was actually in their 20s to 30s and up to a certain level, they could reverse it. Maria Schreiber actually hosted the event and there were so many top people that were at that event and they were just talking about what you could do just naturally. I mean, if you think about it, all we really have to do is sleep properly, eat well and breathe through our nose and we'd be much healthier. How about that? Interesting. One of the things that we talk about is the, the three demographic groups that you can kind of break out for discussion and also for talking to the public of those that have um, breathing disordered sleep and the effects of it. The, and of course, with the young children, it's kind of the ADHD uh, discussion. With young adults, particularly females, we talk more about the TMD connection with breathing and dysfunction. And then the third group would be the middle-aged adults. And we talk about de early dementia or not only classic obstructive sleep apnea, but also that whole memory thing. And we've talked about in, in our workshops that 
Uh, two particular studies we saw uh, showed that when you have oxygen deprivation chronically through uncontrolled um, sleep apnea, that you will get a change in the white matter of the brain. Uh, but when they would study that, scan it, and then place those subjects on um, CPAPs, they found within a year that the brain matter returned to absolutely normal. Um, now, this isn't the same as Alzheimer's, but you know it's in the same discussion. Um, and then the other thing they saw were neurotransmitters that got dysregulated and how um, that you could re-regulate those through good oxygenation of the brain and controlling, um, in that case, sleep apnea. So all of these things are overlapping, aren't they? And um, nitric oxide is a big player in, in this whole discussion. Um, well, let me share just a couple more slides with you, and then we'll keep uh, talking about what you all uh, want to talk about in the last Whit. hour or so. Yeah. Wit, may I ask a question? It's Allison. Yeah, Allison. So with, with respect to the, I posted something in the uh, chat a bit ago, and just what you mentioned just now resonated with me because he does have, this particular patient has Lee body syndrome or has been diagnosed with Lee body syndrome. So, you know, I'm just wondering if, if, you know, this is a nitric oxide, you know, yeah. I think he could, I'm trying to get him to a myofunctional therapist. I, I think those of us that have dealt with Alzheimer patients and those with Lewy body syndrome, they get a little, oh, how shall we say, cranky? Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't, I think they kind of get overwhelmed because of the onset of dementia and that kind of yeah. thing. Um, but I, I would really love to, the panel's, uh, you know, thoughts on, on on the scenario and if if this is something that, you know, we, we could help him with. That, that, that could this help him? Yeah, and and I would throw this out and then Gina and Laura jump in. But um, you know, obviously, we need a diagnosis of what exactly is going on because there's even different types of Alzheimer's um that we're aware of now but when we think of dementia or brain fog and and memory issues and this sort of thing um then certainly oxygen would be a huge subject sleep uh would be a huge subject to look at and i would say anybody who's struggling with memory issues it would be a great idea to have a sleep study and take a look and see what's going on there for sure uh, that would make sense. And then measuring nitric oxide levels, um, you probably are going to find them severely depleted. And so some strategy there might be something to at least entertain and add to the armamentarium of, you know, how to approach it. Uh, Gina? Yeah, so obviously these things are not going to hurt. They're absolutely going to help. But Louis body is really, um, yeah. you know, a different um, yeah. category all its own, but this has to be contributing to, to dementia, of course, there's no doubt about it, but it's, I don't know of a direct correlation by any means with Louis body. And I think Ann Rice is on, she can sp certainly speak up. Yeah. Anna, you, yeah. So, so, so Gina, um, I, I don't know if you got a chance to read the scroll or not. Um, so he has um, this particular patient, and, and I appreciate everybody that, that's listening to this, and I'd, I really would love some um, uh, feedback. Um, total implant supported dentition, so he has no proprioception. In centric relation, his back teeth touch, okay? And he does not clack. And that he says, I'm ruining his life because his back teeth or his, his teeth clack together. However, in central relation, they do not clack. In his habit bite, his front teeth clack, quote, unquote. Um, and I, I recently, his, today, his wife, I called and talked to them both, and his wife told me he's developed a swallowing problem 
where he's choking when he tries to swallow. And I'm wondering if it's a lack of nasal breathing. And I'm trying to get him to see a myofunctional therapist. There's like one in my area. But anyway, I'd, I'd appreciate any of your thoughts on that because he's a sweet, sweet old man and I just want to help him so much. Did you say that he had implants or that there was no implants? Total implant supported dentition, no proprioception. Mm -hmm. So when, when I was working for um, Abident, I would make a measurement across that maxilla and um, a transverse measurement. And many people, I, I believe now, and, and I've, been a pros I've been a technician for over 50 years. Mm. Um, many people that have prosthetic type problems have a very, their, air, their arch, maxillary arch is too narrow. Mm. And we've lost so many teeth uh, that everything is so narrow and the tongue, the tongue needs to be really evaluated there because he, he probably has a very large tongue problem and the implants are collapsing everything inward. That's, that's my, my take on that. That's what I would look at. Interesting. I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Relative to oral myofunctional therapy, this is a good um, sure. yeah. tip, tip for everybody. Um, I looked and looked and looked around the Tampa Bay area for an oral myofunctional therapist, and I found one hygienist about 10 miles from me who had taken a course. Um, so that wasn't going to work. Um, um, and hadn't really even practiced. Then I was with Joy Moeller, who is really the originator in many ways in dentistry of this subject, um, and talking with her at a meeting in the hallway. And I said, what do you do when you don't have anybody in your area? She said, well, you don't need anybody in your area because oral myofunctional therapy is not a hands-on uh, coaching um, um, or therapy. It can be done using zoom calls so for me i have my patients coached from florida to california or colorado uh, with the oral myofunctional therapists i work with so you can call these experts like joy moeller and they will be happy to work with you some of them have several therapists in the same office and you can um, set up appointments with you know, various people. But what I do is when I have a patient that is a good candidate for oral myofunctional therapy, I will get their permission and I will email uh, them and Joy Moeller um, and say, hey, Joy, I want to introduce you to Laura Hooper and I'd like to refer her to you to get together and talk about whether you might be able to help her um, you know, take it away. Um, and I know you all are going to really enjoy getting to know each other. And that's what we've done. And it's worked out great. It's worked out really well. Um, so um, we can get some names for you all. I, we can research that for you if you'd like for us to and see um, where there are centers that, you know, are true experts that are available to take new patients. But and then I just hand it off and they take care of it from there. And um, that's worked out so well. And you know, they're getting the best treatment possible. And that's what, of course, we are all seeking. And we're kind of calling on Anne Rice. She's in our community as one of the ex leading experts in dementia and Alzheimer's. I just wanted your insight and knowledge as we're talking about this. Um, and if you could unmute yourself, just love to hear maybe some of your thoughts or takeaways on this conversation. Um, well, you were right. You know, it's chicken and egg. So sleep disturbances are going to cause cognitive issues and then the buildup of amyloid plaques. And then the circle starts because you have the plaques and then you can't get the sleep. So most people with whether it's Lewy body, whether it's Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease are gonna have sleep disturbances. Some of the things that you really have to consider when you treat um, with 
CPAPs or oral appliances, especially in certain disorders, which would be Lewy body, is REM sleep disorders. So when we treat their sleep disordered breathing, are we able to get them into REM? And sometimes you're swimming upstream with that because the disease specifically affects that. When we were talking about Lewy body, Lewy body is about acetylcholine and dopamine. Um, reduction. When we reduce dopamine, the same as with Parkinson's disease, that is now considered a movement disorder. It could be a well, Parkinson's is primarily a, a, a smooth uh, muscle movement disorder. But with Lewy body, if it's affecting dopamine, when you're talking about your patient, perhaps some weird swallowing or, or mouth issues, and then we have appliances and things like that, um, it really is a great idea to get whatever their physician is involved in that because you're now dealing with um, a breakdown in some of those muscle processes and swallowing and chewing and all of those things. Um, so it, there's no easy answer to what I just said, but it gets really complicated, I think. But we do know, as you just said, CPAP, we do have one small study from that MyTAP. Maybe they have two small studies. You can course correct this. Um, we know, just like you had said earlier, doctor, with the study of, now that's for mild cognitive impairment. Our sleep apnea appliance is going to cure Alzheimer's disease. Well, no, it's not, but um, every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. And by the way, and um, is a brilliant researcher and clinician as well. And she will be one of our uh, speakers uh, highlighted at our um, IDM Scholar Society uh, revolution in April. So um, you can see we've got a great cast of people coming. And I hope that we have 60 people on the call tonight, which I think is wonderful. And I hope that we can have our not reunion because we haven't met yet, but union come together um, at this um, revolution symposium in April in Florida. It's going to be a great event and uh, we're going to hold it at the St. Petersburg Yacht Club right down on the waterfront um, uh, harbor there in St. Petersburg. It's just gorgeous. And so um, we're very excited. That's going to be our kind of big breakout meeting. And so um, we're, we're really hoping and praying that we'll have a huge crowd and we're going to make it something we're going to combine forces with AOSH and other groups to um, make it just a, a big event all around. And so, and we're really excited to have you present more on this um, at that meeting in April. We're really, really thankful that you're willing to help us out on that. Thank you. I'm excited. Good. Um, may, I, may I interject one more time? Absolutely, Paul. Jump in. The, the doctor that was talking about the patient with the swallowing problem that yeah. had the implants, um, and I love the yacht club because I know Peter Dawson was a major impact with that yacht club. But yeah. anyway, if it, you might want to, what I would do with that patient is I would take them back and lay them down and do the Peter Dawson CR equals CO yeah. and make sure that that's there. And yeah. then I would set them up so that they're in a vertical posture and do the same thing. Yeah. Um, be, because I go back to his first statements, the, what we've got to do is minimize the stress. And right. if he's having stress anytime during the day with, with his closure, that's going to trigger him into the night. Right, right. Great advice, Paul. Thanks. That's good. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with George Catlin, but he was an American painter uh, that was, I believe, from Philadelphia, kind of an aristocrat. Uh, and he decided to travel around the United States and go visit with indigenous groups and paint. And you see the faces of these uh, different um, uh, Native Americans that just the strong jaw, the closed mouth, the just very healthy look. And as, a, as a, an anatomist painter, he began to contrast that with what he saw back in Philadelphia with his buddies hanging out at the social club and smoking cigars and getting diabetes and dying young of, you know, various things. 
Um, and this is what they look like. And so he actually wrote a book, and this is a fun discussion called The Breath of Life or Malrespiration and its effects upon the enjoyments uh, and life of man. And the conclusion of his book was this, shut your mouth and save your life. Um, what an what a insightful statement that was made um, a long time ago, almost 150 years ago at least, um, on somebody that was observing just in nature what they saw, um, really kind of fascinating. And then Audrey Yoon, who's a brilliant researcher and clinician in Los Angeles, California. She's an orthodontist trained at Stanford at the Sleep Center with Dr. G. Mano and actually uh, with Dr. William DeMint. So the two of them were known as the fathers of sleep medicine, uh, Dr. DeMint first, and then Dr. G. Mano, who was from France, joined him, and together they researched at Stanford University for well over 40 years. But Audrey, in her lectures, um, talks about what we see now in this clockwise growth pattern of the jaw back and retreated and the and maxilla as well, down and back. Um, and one of the things that Dr. Mark Piper points out, who's a maxofacial surgeon, has probably done more TM joint surgery than anybody in the world, is that if you look at the maxilla and the mandible and the spinal column, as the endoskeleton, that is the hard bony skeleton that surrounds the soft tissue of the tongue, of the soft palate, of the tonsils and adenoids, and then where that tube flows through, that is our breathing tube. Um, and so you begin to see that if the integrity of the endoskeleton is compromised, such as if the mandible and maxilla begin to regressively grow or fail to fully develop and, and ex express their genetic potential. If you have um, epigenetic or environmental factors, such as congestion and allergies that convert us to mouth breathing, then you're going to get a change in facial structure in the craniofacial complex and super eruption of the premaxilla and retracted growth. If you have breakdown in the temporomandibular joint, um, like the 20 year old young man I saw this morning who had severe breakdown in his joints and severe breathing and severe sleep and severe cognitive uh, compromise, um, ADHD symptoms that had been uh, diagnosed in him. And yet um, his airway was super compromised. And part of that compromise was actually as a result of breakdown in his temporomandibular joints, because with that retrusion comes also a compromise of the integrity of the endoskeleton that surrounds everything that has to fit in that box. And so um, if the box becomes smaller, uh, then the challenge becomes greater. And so, um, of course, one of the best treatments as far as instant success that you can have in working with a situation with a severe airway compromise is to do um, a, a, what they call a counterclockwise rotation surgery of the maxilla and the mandible, orthognathic surgery, where we've seen patients that had almost no airway come out of orthognathic surgery. And even though they felt like they'd just gone through a car wreck <laughs> and they went through the windshield at 60 miles an hour, they wake up saying, I can't believe how well I can breathe and how I instantly can tell a dramatic, dramatic difference. Um, one patient said, I feel like I was living in an efficiency as far as my breathing capacity. And now I feel like I just moved into a penthouse in three hours. And um, so very interesting, the things that we're seeing. So what I want to do um, as we wrap it up tonight, thank you for the good discussion. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of your comments and questions, but we'll keep it going. But I wanted to share with you as we end this calendar year of 2023, what our plan of 2022, what our plans are for 2023. So these are the dates that we have circled um, for 2023 as we continue to grow our IDM Scholar Society and the dates that we want to share with you and hope that you'll circle as well 
Um, we had planned to do our our um, foundations seminar, which is our our two day uh, introductory seminar uh, to um, integrative dental medicine. We had planned to do it in January. We're backing it up to February. We had planned to do it as a live event. And we've decided for right now, uh, we're a little overwhelmed. We're going to do it as a virtual live course, February 3rd and 4th. So we'll have our IDM Foundations virtual seminar on um, February 3rd and 4th. And so Tom Neighbors and Gina Pritchard, Laura Hooper, myself, and uh, a few others will be participating in that. The, the goal of that is to introduce to people who this is relatively new to um, the concepts of the oral systemic connection of inflammation and what that's all about, both locally and systemically. And then the three pillars of integrative dental medicine, airway, breathing, and sleep disorders, um, uh, inflammation, and infection, oral and systemic, and then TMD and dental malocclusion. So that course will introduce those concepts to anyone who's not familiar, who, who has a weak foundation, uh, just to try to get us all on the same um, level playing field. Then in April is the date that um, we've been speaking about tonight that we'll have our IDM Revolution Symposium. This will be open to as large a group as wants to come um, at the St. Petersburg Yacht Club. And we're going to have 20, 20 uh, presentations that'll be 25 minutes each with five minutes for questions at the end. And so it'll be a fast paced um, experience. We're going to have a lot of great sponsors there and fun events related to it. Um, large raffle and some events after, after um, sessions in the evenings. It'll be a beautiful time of year in Florida. So I hope that all of you will come for that um, and bring your staff. Um, they can come and they will love it. It'll be just as pertinent for them as for you. And so that's April 20th and 21st. Then in June, we will have our first um, IDM TMD live workshop. So I'll be teaching that along with Dr. Brian Shaw. Uh, Brian is an MD and also a dentist. Um, his specialty is in uh, TMJ surgery and in orthognathic surgery. Um, he has purchased the practice of Dr. Mark Piper, who I've worked with for 40 years and has just retired in December. But Brian is brilliant. He's Harvard trained. He taught at Yale Medical School. He practiced in Chicago for uh, about 10 or 15 years. Um, just a, a brilliant guy and really a, a super neat person. And so I'm excited for him to teach that course with me. That's a subject that I've been teaching for 35 years and so I'm excited to share what we've learned through the years with you all. And then in August, we're planning to do our foundation seminar again, but this time we're going to do it live. And most likely we're going to do it, I'm going to tell you, tentatively in Nashville, Tennessee. So we're going to go to where Tom Neighbors is and um, spend some time there. We think that's a place that everyone would enjoy going to visit. It's a neat town. It's uh, easy place to get to. It's centrally located. It's a hub for um, for um, Southwest Airlines. And so it's it just a, a great place. We've got a good venue to have the meeting at that we'll have all to ourselves. So we're excited about that and, and um, think that'll be a lot of fun to do it there. Then in September, the first weekend of September, or, the, or meaning the 7th, 8th, and 9th, is the National AOSH meeting. And we want to always promote that because that that is our roots. Those are our roots. And so we'll all be at the AOSH meeting in September. So we won't schedule anything then. But in October, we will have our second um, inflammation live workshop. Um, we've done a virtual one just recently. We've done a live one in June and it went over great. That is um, something primarily with Tom, Laura, and Gina. And I'll participate a little bit, but um, they're going to run that. And it, it has a lot to do with oral pathogens and, and the recognition, diagnosis of screening, testing of those, and treatment of non-surgical perio, as well as getting into understanding all the things that are done in a medical office, such as genus, to evaluate and diagnose a systemic inflammation. So 
blood work and these sorts of things and treatment modalities for systemic inflammation that we feel as oral physicians specializing in oral inflammation, that we should be very familiar with systemic inflammation as well. And so Gina is going to teach us that. And then finally, uh, for 2023 in November, we will have our second um, IDM Airway Live workshop, the same one that we did last weekend that um, we had a great time together and learned so much. And so we're going to do that next November. So look at those dates, find the ones that match up with your uh, needs and wants and time and schedule and put it in your calendar, if you will, and tell your colleagues uh, about it and invite them. So um, we will have another uh, another study group meeting in two months. So that will be in February. Uh, um, and um, it, we, since we've got a course going that first weekend in February, I think it's just before that, if I'm not mistaken, it might be February 1st. We'll confirm that and email you that date. Um, but we'll have our next um, and next um, uh, study club meeting together. Thank you all for participating. Please invite your friends and colleagues to join us. Um, this is how we'll continue to interact with each other and also uh, grow uh, our community uh, of the Scholar Society and uh, get to know each other better. So thank you for being with us. Uh, thank you, Gina and Laura and Tom and everyone for participating tonight. And um, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year to you. Um, we look forward to a very exciting next year as we continue to grow and learn and help more people. So um, happy holidays, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.